page 216, chapter 14, Cruel and Unusual. When I arrived at Santa Rosa Correctional Institution in the town of Milton, Florida, I was escorted to a 40 by 40 foot room where more than two dozen incarcerated men sat sadly while uniformed correctional staff buzzed in and out. There were six feet tall metal cages in the corner that couldn't have been more than four feet by four feet. In all my years of visiting prisons, I had never seen such small cages used to hold a prisoner inside a secure prison. In one cage, wedged into the corner, sat a small man in a wheelchair. I couldn't see his face, but I felt certain it was the inmate I was there to see, Joe Sullivan. The cage was so small that when the guards tried to remove his wheelchair, they couldn't budge it. They tugged at the chair with loud grunts and tried to force it free, but it was completely stuck. I could hear Joe crying. He occasionally made a whining sound and his shoulders jerked up and down. When the staff proposed turning the cage on its side, he moaned audibly. Two inmate trustees lifted and tilted the heavy cage while three officers yanked Joe's chair with a violent pull that finally dislodged it. The guards gave each other high fives. The inmate trustees walked away silently and Joe sat motionless in his chair in the middle of the room looking down at his feet. I walked over to him and introduced myself. His face was tear stained and his eyes were red, but he looked up at me and began clapping his hands giddily. Yay, yay, Mr. Bryan. He smiled and offered me both of his hands, which I took. I wheeled Joe to a cramped office for our legal visit. Despite the terrifying start to the visit, he was extremely cheerful. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was talking to a young child. At the time of his arrest in 1989, Joe Sullivan was a 13-year-old boy with mental disabilities who had suffered severe neglect and abuse from his father. Two older boys had convinced him to help him then burgle the home of an older woman. The day of the burglary, the woman was also brutally sexually assaulted in her home. Joe admitted helping the older boys with the burglary early in the day, but it adamantly denied any knowledge of or involvement in the rape. In spite of the lack of evidence against him, Joe was convicted as an adult and sentenced to life without parole. I explained to Joe how disappointed we were that the state had destroyed the biological evidence that might have allowed us to prove that he was innocent through DNA testing. We had discovered that both the victim and one of his co-defendants had died. The other co-defendant would not say anything about what had really happened, making it extremely difficult for us to challenge Joe's conviction. I then offered our new idea about challenging his sentence as unconstitutionally cruel and unusual punishment, which might create another way for him to possibly go home. He smiled through my explanation, although it was clear he didn't understand all of it. We knew that filing a petition nearly 20 years after Joe's sentence would be difficult, but laws had changed in that time. In 2005, the Supreme Court recognized that differences between children and adults required different levels of punishment, and the death penalty for juveniles was banned under the Eighth Amendment. My staff and I wanted to take this positive development a step further. We wanted to challenge juvenile life without parole sentences. Across the country, we filed similar challenges to life without parole sentence in several other cases, including Ian Manuels in Florida, Trina Garnett in Pennsylvania, and Antonia Nuances in California. We filed cases in Alabama, including one for Evan Miller, a 14-year-old boy condemned to die in prison in Alabama. Evan is from a poor white family in North Alabama. His difficult life was punctuated by suicide attempts that started when he was in elementary school. His parents were abusive and had drug addiction problems, and he had been in and out of foster care. A middle-aged neighbor, Cole Cannon, had come over one night seeking to buy drugs from Evan's mother. The 14-year-old Evan and his 16-year-old friend went to the man's house with him to play cards. Cannon gave the teens drugs and played drinking games with them. At one point, he sent the boys out to buy more drugs. The boys returned and stayed over as it got later and later. Eventually, the boys thought Cannon had passed out and tried to steal his wallet. Cannon was startled awake and jumped on Evan. The other boy responded by hitting the man in the head with a bat. Both boys started beating him and then set his trailer on fire. Cole Cannon died, and Evan and his friends were charged with capital murder. The older boy made a deal with prosecutors and got a parole-eligible life sentence, while Evan was convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. I got involved in Evan's case right after his trial and filed a motion to reduce his sentence, even though it was a mandatory punishment for someone convicted of capital murder who was too young to be executed. At a hearing, I asked the judge to reconsider Evan's sentence to, in light of his age. The prosecutor argued, I think he should be executed. He deserves the death penalty. He then lamented that the law no longer authorized execution of children because he just couldn't wait to put this 14-year-old boy in the electric chair and kill him. 
The judge denied our motion. When I visited Evan in, at the jail, we would have long talks about sports and books, his family, music. We talked about all the things he wanted to do when he grew up. He once told me that a guard had punched him in the chest just because he had asked a question about mealtimes. He started crying as he told me this because he just couldn't understand why the officer had done that. Evan was sent to the St. Clair Correctional Facility, a maximum security adult prison. Not long after he first arrived, he was attacked by another prisoner who stabbed him nine times. He recovered but was traumatized by the experience and disoriented by the violence. When he talked about his own act of violence, he seemed deeply confused about how it was possible he could have done something so destructive. Most of the juvenile life or cases we handled involved clients who shared Evan's confusion about their adolescent behavior. Many had matured into adults who were much more thoughtful and reflective. They were now capable of making responsible and appropriate decisions. They had all changed in some significant way and were now nothing like the confused children who had committed a violent crime. I was 16 years old, living in southern Delaware. I was headed outside one day when our phone rang. My mother answered it as I strolled past her. A minute later, I heard her scream inside the house. I ran back inside and saw her lying on the floor sobbing. Daddy, daddy, while the phone's receiver dangled from its base. I picked it up. My aunt was on the line. She told me that my grandfather had been murdered. My grandfather had for some time lived alone in the South Philadelphia housing projects. It was there that he was attacked and stabbed to death by several teens who had broken into his apartment to steal his black and white television set. He was 86 years old. Our large family was devastated by this senseless murder. We all kept saying and thinking the same thing. They didn't have to kill him. There was no way an 86-year-old man could have stopped them from getting away with their loot. My mother could never make sense of it, and neither could I. I knew kids at school who seemed out of control and violent, but still I wondered how someone could be so pointlessly destructive. My grandfather's murder left us with so many questions. Now, decades later, I was starting to understand. In preparing litigation on behalf of the children we were representing, it was clear that these shocking and senseless crimes couldn't be evaluated honestly without understanding the lives these children had been forced to endure. Generally considered to encompass ages 12 to 18, adolescence is defined by radical changes. There are the obvious and often distressing physical changes associated with puberty, but there is also an increased capacity for reasoned and mature judgment, impulse control, and autonomy. Adolescents are still developing biologically and psychosocially, gaining life experience and background knowledge to inform their choices. The self-confidence needed to make reasons, judgments, and stick by them is only just starting to kick in. Working on behalf of clients who have been tried as teenagers, we argued that neuroscience and new information about brain chemistry help explain the impaired judgment that teens often display. On top of the stresses all teens experience, those who grow up poor or in environments marked by abuse, violence, dysfunction, neglect, and the absence of loving caretakers are left vulnerable to the sort of extremely poor decision-making that results in tragic violence. We also argued that a death in prison sentence is like the death penalty, an unchangeable once and for all judgment on the whole life of a human being that declares him or her forever unfit to be part of civil society. We asked courts to recognize that passing such a judgment on children below a certain age is not reasonable. There are human works in progress. Their potential for growth and change is enormous. Almost all of them will outgrow criminal behavior and is practically impossible to detect the few who will not. We emphasize the hypocrisy of not allowing children to smoke, drink, vote, drive without restriction, give blood, and buy guns because of their well-recognized lack of maturity and judgment, while simultaneously treating some of the most at-risk, neglected, impaired children exactly the same as full-grown adults in the criminal justice system. In May 2009, the Supreme Court agreed to review Joel Sullivan's case and the case of Terrence Graham, a 16-year-old from Jacksonville, Florida, who had also been convicted of a non-homicide sentence to life with no parole. It felt like a miracle. There was a possibility that the court might create constitutional relief for all children sentenced to die in prison. Here was a thrilling chance to change the rules across the country. We filed our brief in the U.S. Supreme Court. We were supported by national organizations, including the American Psychological Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Bar Association, and the American Medical Association, as well as by former judges and prosecutors, social workers, civil rights groups, and human rights groups. 
In November 2009, after the briefs were filed in Joe's case and the Graham case, I went to Washington for my third U.S. Supreme Court oral argument. The court was packed and national media was covering the case. A wide assortment of children's rights advocates and lawyers and mental health experts was watching closely when we asked the court to declare life without parole sentences imposed on children unconstitutional. During the argument, I told the court that the United States is the only country in the world that imposes sentences of life imprisonment without parole on children, a practice that violates international law. We showed the court that these sentences are disproportionately imposed on children of color. We argued that these harsh punishments were created for adult criminals and were never intended for children. I also told the court that to say to any child of 13 that he is fit only to die in prison is cruel. I had no way of knowing if the court had been persuaded. Now all there was to do was wait. Ending on 224. Toodles.